This is Peru, the golden empire of the Incas. Well, it looks more like Newark or Croydon Airport. Peru, the romantic kingdom conquered and looted by Pizarro, but this is plain, unromantic hard work. We are bound through Andean skies for strange regions of the unknown, but first we've got to load the planes. This is the Shippy Johnson expedition off for the wild lands of the inner Andes. We expect almost anything. We expect astonishing wonders and marvels, and we find them. As we fly wings over the Andes, we are going to find weird perils, a forgotten citadel of the Incas and the Great Wall of Peru. We're going to swoop down into the valley of 40 volcanoes and find something we little expect, the feast of the airplane in the Lost Valley. We're off, whirling through the sky, bound for those Andean perils. We have two planes flying side by side. On a jaunt like this, it's a good idea to have two planes. At least you feel more comfortable. There are no landing fields up here. If one plane is forced down, well, the other can at least fly back and tell the world about it. We are flying high in the realm of the condor, in rarefied atmosphere 20,000 feet above sea level. So our planes are equipped with superchargers, and we must carry containers of oxygen to keep from passing out. The change in density of the atmosphere played queer tricks. The rectangular tins of gasoline were forced out of shape and became almost round. From the cabin window, we take some of the highest motion pictures ever made from an airplane, pictures of Andean glaciers, such as it would be impossible to take from the ground. We feel the same thrill that Pizarro and his men in armor must have felt when they first sighted the mysteries and glories of the empire of the Incas. And then across the main range, on a lofty plateau, we find a vast citadel. Machu Picchu, it's called. It covers the whole top of that mountain down there. The Inca emperors built it as an eastern bulwark of their empire, an outpost against the savages of the Andean forest. When the Spaniards came, the beautiful Inca girls, the virgins of the sun, fled here to escape the invader. This Inca citadel had been swallowed up by the jungle, lost. It was forgotten until an American explorer came some years ago and cleared away the green tangle. But now its white granite walls are almost covered again. And then we look down upon a series of green amphitheaters, like a flock of Yale bowls without the coeds and coonskin coats. Later, we hear from a priest that these were used by the Incas for their dramatic spectacles. Or were they simply agricultural terraces? No one knows. Horseshoes in the sands of time, moving horseshoes. Sand dunes, strangely symmetrical sand dunes. They are blown by the ceaseless trade winds. Geologists tell us that they travel at the rate of 60 feet a year, so we take their word for it. We land in front of one just to see how big they are. It's 25 feet high and 175 feet from tip to tip. The fine grains blow right through the tiniest fittings of our motors and cameras. They do a perfect job of sandblasting our propellers, too. And the tiny particles of quartz strike our faces like a thousand needles. Well, these dunes cover the floor of Peru for more than 200 miles. The strip of dunes is about 10 miles wide. They're not far from the coast. And then we come upon an extraordinary wall. It runs for miles and miles across the country. It's built of uncut stones cemented together with mud. It stretches beyond the horizon, far back into the mountains. This is the great wall of Peru, and few travelers have ever seen it. It is believed to be older even than the Incas. The Chimus are said to have built it, a race conquered by the Incas. The Chimus had reached a high stage of civilization along about the time when Europe was emerging from the Dark Ages. A mighty, mysterious relic of dim antiquity. And here and there, we find a massive fort. Well, this wall tells a strange story of empires forgotten by people who themselves have been forgotten. Then we fly on in the direction of the City of the Sun. Cuzco, the capital of Peru in the days before the Spaniards came and built Lima, the present capital. Here, the Inca emperors and their followers worshipped the sun. The virgins of the sun lived in the rectangular buildings that we fly over. The most beautiful were chosen for a great honor to be the brides of the Inca. Today, Cuzco, the city of the sun, is a Christian city with great cathedrals and convents and monasteries. Here today we find the familiar romantic life of old Spain. The natives are fascinated by our airplanes. 
They are fascinated, much as they must have been when the Spaniards came with their shining armor and blunderbusses. As we fly down one of the crowded streets, the people behave like a well-trained corpse. Watch them turn. We have flown over dizzy heights of the Andes. We have seen the citadel of the Incas, the horseshoes in the sands of time, and the great wall of Peru. And now let's stop for a moment and do a little sightseeing. Landing up here at this altitude is a rather dangerous business. One other flyer had been to this field. He was killed. He was a Peruvian. In trying to take off, his plane didn't climb fast enough in the rare air. He plunged head on into the mountain. Well, for today, we're not going to be explorers of the perilous unknown. We're just sightseers for a moment, tourists on the hoop. Let's do a travel on. This old cathedral was built in the 17th century. The Spaniards were great builders, but they fought among themselves. In the end, Pizarro's companions ran him through with their swords while he cursed them for being traitors. And as a dying gesture, the conqueror of Peru, with his finger in his own blood, traced a cross on the floor. How the Incas fitted the stones for their own temples is one of the mysteries of their lost civilization. They used no cement, and you can't push a razor blade between the stones. Since we are temporarily tourists with our Kodaks handy, we can't possibly miss the world-famous Llama of Peru. They call it Yama. Llama is the English. No tourist would ever pass up the Llama any more than he would pass up the camel in Arabia or the elephant's piling teak on the road to Mandalay. In Inca days, this little cousin of the camel was used both for religious purposes and for transportation. The worshippers used to sacrifice thousands to the solar deity. Nowadays, they're used only for transportation, food, and clothing. The llama will carry a load of anywhere up to 100 pounds. If you put more than that on his back, he'll lie down and spit at you. He's the delivery wagon of Peru. And it's curious to see a delivery wagon wearing pajamas. As a matter of fact, the natives make everything but pajamas out of llama wool. It's woven into clothing and into soft blankets, which come in mighty handy in the high Andes. She holds the spool of wool with her toes. Her son wears sandals made from an old automobile tire. That's where the old tires go. Knobby tread, non-skid balloon sandals. In Paris, the tourist never misses Philly of Soul Mercury. In Baltimore, it's Tarrapin all on Maryland. In Cusco, the tourist never misses Llama Stew. But, oh boy, he wishes he had. It seems to us as if the Cuzco cook had put some of those old automobile tires in the llama stew. The boys and girls in Cuzco have excellent table manners. Excellent table manners for two reasons. Because they haven't any tables, and because they never eat with their knives. They haven't any knives. As for bananas and cream, they haven't any cream, but they have plenty of bananas and other fruits, too, sent up from the lower altitude. Little Carmen Dolores on the left is not tootling a uh, flagellet. She's nibbling a stalk of sugar cane. The banquets of the descendants of the Incas make us think longingly of Mike Murphy's dish of corned beef and cabbage. On the outskirts of Cusco, we come upon a scene that takes us back to Bible times a thousand years ago. But this sort of wheat production needn't cause the Dakotas, the Argentine, and Russia to lose any sleep. The South American Indians, like the ancient Israelites and Philistines, thrash their wheat by hand and let the wind blow the chaff away. Their idea of mass production is to let horses' hooves do it. This is their modern way, introduced by the Spanish conquerors. It's tough on the outside horse. He travels about eight times as far as the others but he'll be promoted someday. Ah, here's the scene that has the real biblical touch. The noble ox plods round and round, helping the modern Peruvian farmer obtain grain for his Peruvian bread. The youngster doesn't believe in taking the bull by the horns. He has stumbled on an easier way, but that's an old tale. There are pitch portions of wood, and a small cross fashioned of wheat stalks blesses the proceedings. During the harvesting season, all the members of the family take part in the work, and that's about the only season when they do. Throughout most of the year, the men leave the joys of work that the poets sing about to the women. 
That seems to be a noble idea shared by most primitive people. Where did she get that hat? No, not from Paris. It was handed down from the days of the Incas. I mean the style, not the hat. It's made of grass, worn only by the pure-blooded Indians. And after the wheat is loaded on the Peruvian wheelbarrow, off it goes to the family storehouse. Fine regular soldiers. But back in the hills, they do as David did. They paste a rock at you with a slingshot. Well, this is one of the great days of the year here. And it is in all Catholic countries. The people come from miles around to Cuzco for the great procession. At the Feast of Corpus Christi, the Andean hillmen and the city folks of Cuzco vie with each other for the honor of carrying huge floats mounted on eucalyptus logs. Here goes the venerable image of Santiago, St. James, the same saint who appeared in this plaza and turned the tide of battle again. Flying on, flying south, we pass the aristocrat of the Andes. El Misti, the most famous volcano in all Peru. El Misti means the gentleman. But like other gentlemen, El Misti goes on a bust now and then and is anything but a gentleman. It's hard to realize that that crater is a half a mile wide. Its rim is 19,200 feet above sea level. This is the first time anyone ever flew over the crater of El Misti. In fact, we fly inside the walls of the crater to get some pictures. No one had ever ventured there. The deadly fumes are too strong. If you tried it on foot and attempted to keep away from the poisonous vapor, the wind might change in a flash and you'd never get out. The sulfur fumes are so strong in the plane that we have to use our oxygen tanks. And as we gasp and sputter, we are reminded of the Inca prince whose father wouldn't let him marry the girl he loved, so they jumped into the boiling cauldron. We were told that Inca virgins of the sun were thrown into this inferno to keep El Misti from wiping out. Nestling at the foot of El Misti is Arequipa, whose name means stay a while, probably named by the ancient Inca Chamber of Commerce. It is called to the City of Silver. And on the outskirts of the City of Silver, we pay a visit to a Peruvian outdoor Madison Square Garden, or Olympia. We are invited to attend a heavyweight bout. Not boxers, but bulls. Each man likes his own bull and bets on it. What you bet depends on what you've got to bet, but it also depends on how many jolts of chicha you have under your belt. This is a champion. Well, if you drink a quart of chicha, you may even think that you're one of the contestants and want to go out and throw the bull. Folks come from hovels and haciendas, far and near and all the spectators consider themselves expert on the subject of bull. In these heavyweight bouts, no one is hurt except the fans who have bet on the local losing boy. They don't start trading punches right off the bat. They waltz around, eye each other, spar for an opening, and then they go to it, grunting, snorting, bellowing. The earth shakes as they paw and push each other back and forth. They're like two snorting railroad engines, not in collision, but simply each attempting to shove the other off the field and off the earth. But it's a real fight. The referee doesn't try to pull them apart when they get in a clinch. <laughs> Finally, the hometown boy says uncle, gives up, turns tail, and runs away. Whereupon a new champion is crowned in Arequipa, the city of silver. And now, having taken in all the sights, we're off for the Valley of Volcanoes. We exchange cloud-climbing airplanes for mountain-climbing mules. The Peruvian mule is as ornery as any of the mule family with this difference. What he doesn't see, he doesn't worry about. We pile on our equipment, but the mules never found it out. They were blindfolded when it was done. Yes, we have exchanged earth inductor compasses and superchargers for stirrups and spurs, rudder bars for reins. And at considerably less than 100 miles an hour, we take off for a jaunt in the footsteps of the Spanish dawn. Where we are headed for, the chances of a happy landing are a lot better if you're on a mule. We're going where there are no landing fields. For days and days, we jog along dusty, sometimes dangerous trails, 28 days, in fact. We cross mountain streams, swinging on suspension bridges. We cling to precipitous mountain walls. Slower traveling than by plane, but less danger of a tailspin. And after many days on the trail, we come to the Valley of Volcanoes. 
It's more than 40 miles long, and in it are more than 40 volcanoes. This tortured space of Earth represents some titanic convulsion in distant time. Think of the fireworks when the demons of the underworld sent all that lava spurting from all these volcanoes. Whole towns were buried under the streams of boiling rock. That's the theory of geologists. But the names of the towns are unknown. The entire valley floor is a twisted mass of lava, like a mass of cool molasses. It's one of the strangest, one of the most uncanny regions on Earth. In one place, the lava dammed a river. The result is a green lake, as though an emerald had slipped from the finger of a giant cook and fallen into the molasses. This valley of volcanoes looks as though it might be a valley of the moon. In the lee of two volcanoes at an altitude of 13,000 feet is the old town of Andagua. And Andagua means running water. The members of the expedition had been unable to find out anything about the valley beyond the fact that the town of Andagua, the head of it, is mentioned in some 17th century documents. The craters are all quiet now, so we climb one volcano. Its rim is set down into the dreary crater. We gaze back at the giant peaks that rear their snowy summits into the cloudless Andean sky. Few travelers have ever been here. Why, the natives didn't even know that 40 volcanoes were in their valley. They thought they were hills. They had only looked up at them and not down at them as we do. This is the bottom of the crater. Here we pitch our tents. We find neither snakes nor scorpions. It's too desolate even for them. The only plant life is some dreary scrub and cactus, which seems more forbidding and death-like than the naked lava. To celebrate our arrival in this crater in the Valley of Volcanoes, the members of the expedition solemnly open a can of beans and stage a banquet. The can opener had vanished on the journey over the mountain, so the only way to get into the beans is by means of the old Broadway stunt, chiseling. The gentleman who looks like a master of ceremonies at a rodeo is Valentine Van Curen, the topographer, the surveyor of the party. The gentleman with the spinach who is filling himself with beans is not a Bolshevik spy. He's a member of the expedition who forgot his razor. In fact, he's one of the heads of the expedition, Robert Shippey. And on the left now is Tuck Johnson, Lieutenant Johnson the other head of the party. Not far from the encampment in the crater, we come upon a burial cave in a cliff. We call it the Cave of Skulls. Perhaps the natives fled here during the days when they were persecuted by the Spaniards. Or they may have taken refuge here in the higher slopes of the valley when all those 40 volcanoes were belching flame and lava. At any rate, we come upon hundreds of human skeletons. A Peruvian dog had attached himself to the party as a mascot. He had never been at an altitude lower than 7,000 feet. He chased what he thought was a ball. It turned out to be an ancient skull. The skull, perhaps, of some great sage among primitive men or some renowned warrior. Along the trail, on our way from the Valley of Volcanoes, we cross a mountain torrent by a Ponte del Zorro, or Fox's Bridge, a suspension bridge made of woven grass, fibers, and small sticks. A real engineering feat, a masterpiece. Bridges like this are found all through the high Andes. The method of making them probably dates far back to the dim past, before the days of the Incas. Of course, they don't last as long as a steel suspension bridge. They have to be repaired every rainy season. And the footing is none too secure. And to the traveler, this is a bridge of size. Crossing is a nerve-wracking job for everybody but the mules. Mules haven't any nerves, I guess. But the mules are not exactly mountain goats at that. Maybe you think a mule is always dizzy, but they get dizzier in high altitudes. Up here, 18,000 feet above sea level, the mules became so exhausted in the thin air that the boys had to hold smelling salts to their nostrils. I mean the mule's nostrils. Holding smelling salts to a mule's nose. Ha <laughs> ha! In the background, dominating the scene, looms the highest mountain in all Peru, Mount Corapun, 24,000 feet high. And this is the trail that leads us to our final goal. We have seen the citadel of the Incas, the great wall of Peru, the valley of the 40 volcanoes. And now we have come through desolate, wild, barren country to a lonely, remote region where we are to encounter another surprise, the feast of the airplane in the lost valley.
Orinoco River are 14 villages founded in about 1600. The people of the rest of the Peru hardly even know that they are there. Because of plagues, famines, and earthquakes, the region is now almost as desolate as the valley of volcanoes. Most of the houses are falling to pieces. One morning we came out and found our cook going through a weird performance. At first we thought it was an Inca hula hula. But it turned out that our charming cook was simply doing her daily dozen, improving her figure and husking wheat to make bread for us all at the same time. As Senior Shippy put it, she was a maiden with lots of culture but it was all physical. This does seem like an unceremonious way of preparing biscuits for breakfast. Mother never did it like this. Mother never shucked wheat with her corns. The girls in the Lost Valley wear six or seven skirts at a time. How do we know? Well, we were told. Yes, and we were told that from the day they are born, they never bathe. They add a skirt a year. They keep wearing them all, except those that disintegrate and fall off. No wonder they look husky. They sleep in them, never take them off. The scenery isn't dreary if you look up. Beyond the graceful eucalyptus trees tower the symmetrical snow-capped peaks of the Cordilleras. This church, the largest in the Lost Valley, is a tribute to the energy of the Franciscan friars. They must have expected a real estate boom. It's built of stone blocks three or four feet thick. The massive buttresses are to protect the church against earthquakes. Between earthquakes and volcanoes, no wonder the real estate boom never got anywhere. The sexton unlocks and opens the creaking door. A priest enters. There are now only two priests in the Lost Valley. They used to have an interesting custom here. When the village authorities needed money, they would herd the young unmarried people into a church and lock them in for the night. In the morning, they would pull the couples out two by two. That meant they were married and they had to pay a marriage fee. Tradition has it that this church was once entirely adorned with gold leaf and filled with statues brought from Spain. We still see traces of that lost glory, but most of the statues have disappeared and the woodwork has been chiseled away by the marauding Indians. The pride and joy of the natives is their statue of Santiago, patron saint of the Spanish fighting men of old. 400 years ago, the ancestors of the Andean Indians trembled before the old battle cry, Santiago and Spain. And now comes the snorting dragon out of the sky. We had arranged for one of our planes to pick up a message. Two poles were rigged up on top of the church, between them a string with a message on it. The pilot drops a wire with a weight. The dangling weight hits the string, winds around it, picks up the message. Watch how it's done. In answer to the message, the plane later returns and drops supplies, food, socks, cigarettes, and so on. But he can't land. With strips of white cloth laid on the ground, the party in the valley signal to the swimming plane. They tell how they intend to lay out a flying field in the Lost Valley, an airport in the veil that time forgot. Now comes a bit of Shippy Johnson diplomacy. There wasn't a single level space what, but what was covered with boulders. The natives were tremendously excited by the Thunderbird. They wondered, had it feathers like the condor or wool like the llama? Headed feet like the toucan or a bill like the pelican. We tell them we'll give them a close look at the Thunderbird, but there are a few small ceremonies that they'll have to perform. Ceremonies consisting of moving stones, pushing a few big rocks around. And we still further excite their worship by purchasing a large supply of chicha. Then we perform a few magic rites of our own. I mean we get out the transit and level and survey the proposed flying field to the great astonishment of the natives. The handsome high priest of the transit is Val Van Curen. The Indians think he's going through a part of the mystic ritual. Then follows the great stone rolling ceremony in the Lost Valley. Push him up, Tony, or you'll never see the Thunderbird again. And Tony pushes hard. How would you like to catch that one in your hat? Oh, boy. Well, the Indians in this valley hadn't done so much work since their ancestors fought the Spaniards in the days of yore. Making an aerodrome most anywhere is a tough job. Here, we're at an altitude of 12,000 feet. The air is thin, and the rocks are hard. Yes, the air is thin, but the hope of seeing the Thunderbird is strong. The rocks are hard, but so is the Chicha. The Lost Valley may be short on the tricks and gadgets of modern civilization. It may lack electric lights, radio, open plumbing, and movie shows, but anyway, it's going to have a first-class flying field. 
I don't know whether in the Andes it's the woman who pays and pays and pays, but it certainly is the woman who works and works and works. I wonder what the boys and girls are going to do with this airport after Shippy and Johnson are gone. It might make a good landing place for condors, or they might use it to hold bear parades, chicha parades, I should say. Near the landing field, there was a deposit of white chalky material. It turned out to be magnesium, too far from civilization to be of commercial value, but it did come in handy. The boys added an artistic touch to the flying field by outlining it in magnesium white. At the end of each day, the natives paraded back to town in military formation, or what they called military formation. There was one wheelbarrow in the valley. The chauffeur of that wheelbarrow certainly has a load. Watch him. But the load isn't in the wheelbarrow. And now came the festival of the airplane in the Lost Valley. There was a grand parade, a beer parade, a chicha parade, headed by the local Jimmy Walker. While through the air, the Thunderbird came winging to take its place as the guest of honor for the occasion. There was music, too much music. Occasionally, a man from the Lost Valley will serve in the Peruvian army. Because of the rarefied air in the Andes, they have a tremendous lung capacity. So in the army, they are signed up as buglers. And then they soon take French leave from the army, and they carry away as many musical instruments as they can lay hands on. So there was a blaring of bugles and trombones at the piece of the airplane. And from across the giant mountain comes the plane. Wings over the Andes. Our brand new landing field worked beautifully. Neither the Newark Airport, nor Croydon London, nor Le Bourget Paris could have served the purpose any better. The whole countryside gathered to see the strange sight. They came in long gala processions from all 14 villages of the Lost Valley. howled and gaped, and they played on bugles. They rubbed their eyes to be sure the chicha wasn't making them see things. But they found that the Thunderbird didn't show any signs of biting, also that it didn't have feathers like the condor, or wool like the llama, or claws like the toucan, or a bill like the pelican. They also had music on the harp. Maybe it wasn't a heavenly harp. Maybe the members of the orchestra don't exactly look like cherubim and seraphim, but the local high-altitude Floridora sextet finds it something to get busy about just the same. The traditional standard of the Lost Valley is raised solemnly along. It looks like a bunch of pie plates. But that isn't tin, that's silver. Splendid pieces of antique Spanish silver. Presiding over the feast of the airplane in the Lost Valley was His Excellency the Alcade, the mayor, the local Jimmy Walker. He seems to be in good form. What's the reason? Yes, Chicha. The women are kept busy dispensing the local brew, of which the Alcade has quaffed plentifully. His Excellency the Mayor arranged for a gift to be presented to the men who command the Thunderbird. At first we thought he was kidding us. He was. The gift was a kid, a tiny goat. The kid is introduced to our regular mascot, the Peruvian condor chaser that had long been a member of the expedition. And now comes the grand climax of the Feast of the Airplane in the Lost Valley, a speech by His Exalted Excellency the Alcatel. Fellow citizens, R.H. the Mayor, we're here to greet these great Americanos who jump over mountains, fall down precipices, and make people roll stones.
While Johnson and Shippy, the dog and the goat, listen spellbound, or almost spellbound, although I'm afraid the two mascots are not interested in the oration of the Cicero of the Cordilleras. And now we are on. We have seen the citadel of the Incas, the great wall of Peru, the valley of 40 volcanoes, and the feast of the airplane in the Lost Valley. We head northward, homeward, in the machine that an Indian woman called a fiery cross accompanied by heavenly trumpets. 